I hold a lot of unpopular opinions. Whenever people call a game bad, I'm usually one to look for the good in it and have a good time. However, this also has the opposite effect where I'll hear non-stop praise for some new release, and I just don't see the appeal. I feel like I've had enough experiences like that to make a list like this. Now, as for the qualifications, uh, the word beloved is kind of hyperbably. I'm just using it as a substitute for one word more condescending, like overrated. The word overrated is the equivalent to a slur to gaming YouTubers. Uh, basically, not all of these games are treated like holy gifts from God himself, but they receive enough positive attention that we can say that they're generally well-liked. The way these entries will be ranked will be based on how praised they are in comparison to how much I personally like or dislike them. That's about all I have to say. So, let's get started. This is becoming a lot more common nowadays, but coming up with a bottom entry is getting really tough. There were quite a few games considered for this spot, but to be honest, most of them had actually received their fair share of criticism. So much so that it'd be hard justifying even putting them at the very bottom. So basically, I had to make the very funny choice of which group of fans I wanted to piss off today, and I chose Animal Crossing. <laughs> I'd like to make a formal apology to New Horizons fans real quick. Well, actually no, I don't have to apologize for anything, but... Uh, look, I understand that Animal Crossing's most recent release already has its group of detractors, but let's be honest, this game has sold so tremendously well, and there are way more people who like the game than ones who dislike it. This was one game I think a lot of people loved at first, but then over time came to realize just how much it misunderstood what made the series so special. Now, this is coming from someone who has only played New Leaf. I loved that game, and I have so many nostalgic memories with it. So much so that it truly felt like a whole separate life to me. Now, that probably did sound really pathetic, but that is something at least. And when New Horizons was coming out, I was so stoked to make so many new memories with it. The first few days of the game were slow, yeah, but it really let me soak in the atmosphere of the island that I was soon going to build into a big town as well as still serve as a fun life simulation game. Fast forward a few months later, and I soon came to realize the big issue of the game. Now, there's plenty of cut content from the previous entries, yeah, but my biggest gripe of the game was that Every time I boot it up, I don't feel nearly as engrossed in my island life. Because they essentially turned the game into more of a decorating game than a life sim. Doesn't help that a lot of the aspects that made the series so charming have been watered down, such as the villager conversations and the normal everyday things you do. I mean, don't get me wrong, the new quality of life changes and customization options allow you to make some really gorgeous looking towns, and I can understand why some people might like the game because of that, but for me personally, that's only part of the reason why I like Animal Crossing. The game has been out for over a year at this point, but I haven't made any noteworthy memories about it because of everything I just mentioned. It just feels like the soul is missing. It's kind of hard to describe. And that sucks to say considering how many fun stories I could tell you about my first month with New Leaf. I mean, I've had my fun building my town and stuff, but there's not a whole lot of substance outside of that. But it's at the bottom because plenty of other people have voiced similar thoughts as me. Plus, it's kinda hard to outright hate a game like Animal Crossing. I mean, come on, it's pretty inoffensive. It's just upsetting to me is all. I really don't like Pokemon discussions. Like, they're all the exact same. Sun and Moon are bad for some reason, Generation 5 is underrated even though literally everyone agrees that they're the best in the series, and insert a comment about a poorly textured cliff and we have ourselves a redundant conversation. With that said, before Black and White took the spotlight, there was one other set of Pokemon games that were the most beloved for a while, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the remakes of Generation 2. I don't get the love. These games are far from bad, but I also don't really understand why people think they're some of the best games in the series. In my opinion, design-wise, Generation 2 was really bad. It has one of my least favorite regions and the absolute worst Pokemon selection in the series. I hate choosing between the starters in this game because Totodile and Cyndaquil are so boring. The only one I like is Chikorita, and for whatever reason, the game has an obsidian 
freaking rock hard hate boner for Chikorita. Oh well, guess I'm better off with Typhlosion, which literally has copy pasted stats from Charizard. Like, wh wh what? Team composition in Johto is so bland, it's not even funny because a lot of the new Pokemon either suck or downright aren't available until the post game for some reason. Doesn't help that all the selections up until that point are pretty weak, and all that is compounded by the level scaling here being terrible. You'll be encountering some low level trainers really late into the game, and well, that's simply not going to help you prepare for some of the later fights. Considering that building a team of Pokemon and watching that team grow is my favorite aspect of the series, I'd like to think that you can see why these problems alone are enough for me to not like the game as much as other people. I'm sorry, but this one is just really whatever for me. Not even including the Kanto region in the post game saved it, because admittedly, it's a pretty bland adventure through there too. Uh, don't get me wrong, it's not all bad, because there are plenty of fun parts of the game, and because the remakes are Gen 4 games, you have access to some new Pokemon evolutions that didn't exist in the originals. But even with the additions of the remake, it's not enough to prevent the game from being near the very bottom of the series for me. Credit where it's due, we're still not in the bad territory yet, and I think out of every game on the list, I probably like this one the most, so I'm not going to be too harsh on its ranking. The Paper Mario games are quite the weird case for me. I guess it's to be expected when the series is so indecisive on what it wants to be. My ranking of the games would be completely absurd because I actually like Color Splash and Origami King more than Paper Mario 64. Whoops, did I say that out loud? But at the same time, a Thousand Year Door is still my favorite. However, there's still the oddball that I really don't like. Super Paper Mario is really strange. It was the first game to break from the traditional formula, so I guess you could say it ruined the series, but it still has a lot of fans due to certain aspects of the game. It still has some RPG elements to it, a unique world, and the story is surprisingly really solid for a Mario game. And none of those carried the game for me. Instead of being a turn-based RPG, Super Paper Mario decided to turn itself into a 2D side-scroller while keeping experience points and levels. Ups. I wouldn't mind this change if the level design wasn't an absolute slog. These have got to be the most bog standard 2D levels I've ever seen in my life. And while I do think certain parts of chapters 2, 3, and 7 are fun, the rest is unbelievably forgettable. I tried scripting a video ranking every Paper Mario chapter, and I think that there were only two chapters in this game that weren't in the lower half of the list. And the RPG mechanics don't really add much due to the basic nature of the game to begin with. What really irks me about all this is that whenever there's some discussion about this game, fans of it won't touch these topics with a 10-foot pole. But Logo, the story of this game is really amazing. I mean, fair point, the story is really good and it has a lot of touching and impactful moments in it that I don't think will ever be recaptured in another Mario game. But at the same time, is that really all you have to say about the game in general? If you like the chapters, then that's great, it's fun to talk about some of them. But when somebody brings up the story, I feel like they should be aware that stories can't carry games for certain people. Unless if you're playing a book. I am having the time of my life. I hate the way people treat stories and games nowadays. I understand their importance and they add so much to games I already like, but you can't expect somebody to like a game purely because of that while ignoring legitimate issues with the actual gameplay. Like, I don't love Mario Galaxy for its story and atmosphere. Heck, the story really isn't anything that spectacular. I love the game because it has so many fun levels. Those other aspects I mentioned add to the already good experience to truly make it something spectacular. If you do like the game for its gameplay, then that's fine, just elaborate on it. Uh, this is a real shame because, by all means, this should be a pretty nostalgic game for me, but anymore I can't tolerate just how lackluster it is in most regards. <laughs> Man, I really wanted to like this next one. It really seemed like it was setting itself up to be a great sequel with the best aspects of the previous two games in the series, and it was receiving a ton of positive reception upon release. And unfortunately, I think Luigi's Mansion 3 is just kind of... Alright. Honestly, this feels like a case where people mainly liked it because it was a return to form kind of game. Uh, similar to how people seem to really enjoy Super Mario Party because it removed the car from 9 and 10. 
but I personally think Super is still a really weak Mario Party. Luigi's Mansion 3 does have a lot that puts it above Dark Moon, however, I don't really think it's that much better. So I do have some positives to note off. I really like the environments here, and the addition of Luigi not only makes for good multiplayer, but it adds more depth to the puzzles. Seriously, solving these with a friend or sibling is actually pretty fun. I hope a lot of people got to experience the game this way. With that said though, I believe the game really missed the mark in other areas. Something a lot of people, including myself, didn't like about Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon was how the game was mission based which made exploring the mansions even more linear than before. Which really sucked considering that the level design was actually pretty good for the most part. That's a quality of the game a lot of people undersell. Luigi's Mansion 3 appears to not have that same structure, but let's be honest, it still does. It doesn't have missions per se, but the levels are so straightforward that it might as well still have them. And I get that the first game was pretty linear too, but there was at least more exploration there, hunting for the booze or returning to old areas to find treasure and whatnot. Due to 3 cutting the missions, they could have done more segments of you returning to old floors of the hotel and accessing new areas. They do this like one time, and to be fair, it's on one of my favorite floors in the game, and that's part of the reason why I like it so much, but I feel like exploration is very underutilized here. And don't bring up the polar kitty sections. These are tedious slogs and easily some of the worst parts in the entire game. There is nothing added returning to these old floors to hunt for this puss. It's just straight up padding. Not to mention, they really drop the ball at certain points. It's weird because the game is really polished graphically and whatnot, but a decent amount of the floors in the hotel feel downright incomplete, especially in the latter half where they start getting shorter and less interesting. This one disappointed me a lot because it has so much going for it. It is the most Nintendo-y game Nintendo has made in a long time. I love the little details and character interactions here, and it goes to show that we are in desperate need for more Mario & Luigi voice clips. It's absolutely brimming with charm and some good ideas, but I can't help but feel like it's still lacking. This next one in particular really hurts me because it's one of the most beloved games in its entire series and it's one that I so desperately want to get into, but I question whether or not it's even my cup of tea. So, uh, are y'all ready? Because, uh, next up is Final Fantasy VI. <laughs> I feel especially bad about this one. I've known about the Final Fantasy series for a long time now, and it's one of many series that I want to become a fan of. I surprisingly had some fun with the first game, and I was really excited to play 6. And so, I proceeded to play it for 15 hours, and most of that time was spent saying, Okay, but when does it get good? I was just waiting for the story or the gameplay to become engaging, and simply put, it didn't. Now I know what I just said is probably more insulting than farting really loudly in a library on purpose. <laughs> But let me explain myself. First off, the story. Now, I understand that it's an old game, so I gotta cut it some slack for writing since, well, around this time, games didn't really have a ton of grand stories. The thing is though, here the writing is so unexpectedly bare bones that I was just not interested in this world, which is a shame because it actually seems like they have some cool ideas going here. At times, it becomes the equivalent of a high schooler's book report assignment. I can understand if people disagree with this, but it feels like it doesn't give you much detail aside from the bare necessities, which is really bad for an RPG. Also, a minor nitpick, but I can't stand how the text boxes are presented. Uh, there aren't any sound effects for them, and sometimes it will display multiple quotes from different characters in one box, and I hate it. Shut up. In all honesty, though, I think I could live with all my issues with the lackluster writing and story if I liked the gameplay, which... And... Okay, so I do like how all of the characters have really unique abilities and commands. There's a surprising amount of variety here, such as learning attacks from monsters, or even doing inputs on the controller to unleash a special move. Aside from that though, I didn't really think it was that fun. I usually ended up doing the same actions for every battle, and I turned out fine. But there are mechanics there that make me understand why other people would enjoy it, I just didn't think much of it myself. Now with that said, I'm the type of person who hates leaving games unfinished. No matter how bad it is or how much I hate it, I'll typically stick with it till the bitter end. The only exceptions are if the game is a special kind of boring. And well, I got about halfway through this and uh, I still didn't 
think much of it. To give you an idea of where I stopped, I got to that one famous moment that I'm not going to spoil for all five of you who don't know about it. Like, I spent days, hours on this game, and after that point, I just dropped it and never picked it back up since. I remember wanting to get back into it because I could have tied that moment with another one on my insane moments list since they're kind of similar, but I just couldn't for the life of me convince myself to play anymore. It's the only game on this list that I haven't finished. Even with all that said, I am willing to one day pick it back up and finish it. I mean, who knows? The game could become top tier after that point. But as of now, I'm sorry, I don't like it. But if this part of the list becomes outdated, then that's a win for all of us. I have a very weird relationship with indie games. A lot of people really hype them up, and because of that, I typically end up being disappointed by them. Though whenever I think about it more, there are actually a lot that I like, such as Lisa, I love that game to death. And yeah, I remember getting so freaking annoyed about hearing about A Hat in Time whenever it was first released, and later, I finally played it myself, and uh, I was really surprised that I liked it so much. Now, if only I could say the same thing about bug fables. This one received a lot of attention due to it being clearly inspired by the classic Paper Mario games. Uh, kinda weird how we're bringing those up again. But anyway, it was supposed to scratch an itch that had been left unscratched for so very long, and I thought it was kinda boring. It's definitely a step in the right direction, but there were a ton of issues I had with it that turned it into a pretty mediocre experience. It has a lot of interesting ideas with the battle systems, such as you controlling three characters and even being able to exchange turns between your your party members. Problem is, while there are some neat strategies you can make, I don't feel like there's enough depth for battles to not become really repetitive later on. This is caused by multiple things, but mainly how lame it feels to get level ups. In Paper Mario, whenever you got a level up, you could choose from one of three stats to increase by a fair amount. It made it really satisfying to fight and gain levels. Here though, well, you can choose from those same three stats, but this time it's Funny. One health point for every character. Three team points used for special moves. By the way, everybody shares from this amount. And three badge points that everybody also shares. Do you see why I hate communism now? Speaking of badges, they really suck here. A lot of them are lame and situational, plus everyone shares from the same pool of badge points, even though the badges can only affect one character at a time. All of that for what? A 50% chance to prevent getting poisoned on one character? I mean, that sounds like an absolute steal, baby! Now that example was very cherry-picked. There are some cool badges there, but a good amount of them are so underwhelming. I stopped bothering with badge points halfway through the game because I just couldn't find any exciting badges that I really wanted to use. Even outside of the battle system, I still have problems such as the chapters. They're a real mixed bag. The first three are really solid, four and five are boring slogs, six is a mixed bag, and seven is actually really good. The middle point was really when all of the game's problems were highlighted and I was bored to tears, especially in chapter four. There are a lot of things I do appreciate such as the abundance of unique side quests, and there clearly was a lot of effort put into the game, but I'm not going to hold it in the same regards as its inspiration. That may seem like an unfair comparison considering one game comes from one of the biggest names in the gaming industry, while the other comes from an indie team, but whenever I hear people say it's just as good if not better than the old Paper Mario titles, then of course I'm going to hold it to a similar standard. Considering how many popular RPGs are on this list, it really makes it seem like I hate the genre. Honestly, Xenoblade would have been a good fit here if it wasn't for the fact that it was so unfun that I dropped it after two hours. Oh, what have I done? But this one is a much more recent example, and if you followed my Twitter at some point from February to April, then... One, I'm sorry, and two, I don't regret a thing I said about Bravely Default 2. I've been heavily considering doing a video on this one, so I'm not going to go into absurd detail here about everything I dislike, but let me at least give you some context as to why this game in particular gets under my skin. I've mentioned it a few times before, but I love Bravely Second. It's a wonderful sequel to Bravely Default that unfortunately not a whole lot of people played compared to its predecessor. Due to its lack of major attention, as well as criticisms that I personally don't believe hold much water, 
the developers were actually not quite fond of the title despite all of the major improvements it made. So when developing a brand new entry, they decided to start fresh by titling it Bravely Default 2. And let me just say that just because you're going to ignore the sequel doesn't mean you have to ignore all the improvements it made as well. A Bravely Default 2 is like if you took the first Bravely Default and shoved its balls into a wood chipper. It's even more flawed and the good parts aren't even that good. The job system is so incredibly watered down with countless lame abilities and attacks that make grinding so unsatisfying, whenever it was so much fun in second. The battle system here is worse due to the brand new turn order and it makes the speed stat way too important. In the first two games, you set all of your turns at once, but now all of your character's turns are set separately. This means that if you're too slow, then one of your characters will constantly get skipped over. Because of this, some jobs are outclassed sheerly because of that hindrance. The bosses are so poorly designed that the only reason why some of them are even remotely challenging is because the designers decided to tack on a bunch of horrendous counters to them. Yeah, that's okay, giving the boss a free turn whenever I heal or I don't know, use the basic mechanics of the game. Also, why are so many quality of life options that were present in the first game not in this one? Where is the random encounter slider? Why is the difficulty setting so half-assed that it doesn't actually make enemies stronger, it just makes them act quicker? Why are the characters actually pretty decent for the most part, but the story was so rushed that one villain never gets any closure whatsoever? Uh, this is the first game released in recent memory that was blatantly affected by <laughs> And it's so evident in the finale being rushed and unsatisfying. And despite the countless issues I just named off, it's being praised like the second coming of Christ when in reality it's one of the most bog standard RPGs I've ever played in my life. And it's trying to replace one of my favorite games ever. And the only reason why I held back here is because it's getting its own video at some point. And man, that's gonna be really funny. So, uh, this next one is considered a cult classic, and it's one that I've talked about before. I've said a lot of bad things about it, but honestly, even though I really, really don't like it, I can't really say I hate it either. So with that out of the way, let me tell you why I think Grim Fandango is really freaking stupid. Holy crap, this afterlife adventure game is a freaking roller coaster of emotions. Like, there's a reason why so many people love it, it's one of the most legendary point-and-click adventure games out there. It's loved for its fun characters, music, and story, and I actually agree with all those. The soundtrack is great to listen to every now and then, and there's this one song in particular that's really funny to insert this one random part in in certain videos of mine. <laughs> The cast and voice acting is great, the game has plenty of charm, and I actually think it benefits from its old age. Like, there's something oddly appealing about its graphics, it reminds me of Silent Hill in that way. And the story? Well, um, it's certainly not a war and peace, uh, but it feels like a Pixar movie at times. Funny that I mentioned that because I think I'd actually like this game more if it was just a movie because this game's puzzles suck. They suck harder than that time I was playing with the vacuum cleaner. I understand that a lot of old point and click adventure games are infamous for puzzles with stupid nonsensical solutions that you have to guess, but this is on a whole nother level of stupid. The puzzles in this game range from pretty decent to completely ridiculous. And there are puzzles here that require you to do something really dumb. Then, follow that up with doing something else that's really dumb, or your progress on it gets reset. These deadly beavers blocking your path that want to tear you to shreds? Okay, well, I'm going to have to throw him a bone as bait to make him jump into that river. Uh, makes sense. But actually, you have to throw the bone under this ledge, then use a fire extinguisher while they're jumping off, or else they'll just crawl out of the river later. Leaving the mayor to give Squidward community service for the damage he caused. And there are countless other puzzles like that, so much so that they completely kill most of my enjoyment with the game. It's like Super Paper Mario on crack, but at least that game had like two or three standout chapters for its series. This one has very little, and I don't understand why anyone would find it fun to slave away at this game, only to look at a guide and have the solution make them say, Wait, what? I had to deep fry a cucumber, then give it to the homeless man? I will say, even though I don't like it at all, there's still... A a lot of soul here, and the final chapter left a pretty good taste in my mouth, which was great, and that's more than I can say about the next two. <laughs> so, uh, 
So if some of you have been on my channel before or smelled me, then you'll probably figure out that I'm a Smash player. I play it a lot. Very epic game. However, that does mean one thing. It's one thing that I think might shock, scare, or even disgust you. It means... That Fire Emblem killed my family and my dog and my self-esteem. Okay, okay, in all seriousness, I actually used to be a really big Fire Emblem fan. Though I say that, and I only really played the 3DS games. I mean, they were really fun, but by the time I got to Fates, well, things started going wrong. Then came Echoes, which I consider to be one of my least favorite games of all time. It had awful level design, and any remotely interesting mechanic that was there was underexplored or misused, making for a boring, frustrating mess of a game. So needless to say, after a bunch of misses, I wasn't really excited for Three Houses. But I don't know, it's a lot different from the other games, it seems to have a lot of depth, like, it might be fun. And then I played it, and I'm gonna say it right now, the only reason I grinded through this mess is because of a video I wanted to make. Gosh, as I'm going through this video, I feel like I'm getting harsher and harsher on the games, which makes sense, but I really don't want to make it sound like I'm invalidating anybody's opinions. Okay, so let me elaborate on my thoughts a bit. One of the big features of the game was the addition of Garrig Mock Monastery. You essentially are a teacher to all of your units, and you can train them to be proficient in whatever stats you want. You have a lot more control over them in this game than in the others, and I appreciate appreciate how much easier it is to gain weapon experience in this entry. And that's where most of my positives end. I absolutely hated exploring the monastery. It's big and has a bunch of dumb fetch quests, yet at times it felt kinda necessary to do in order to raise my unit's motivation. It was always a huge chore, and it felt like you spent way more time preparing for the main levels than you do actually playing them. And here's the thing, I remember seeing some people on social media saying that even on the normal difficulty setting the game was difficult, and I can sort of see where they're coming from if they're new to the series, but I personally thought this was one of the most painfully easy games I've ever played. I typically don't mind easy games, but this was mind-numbingly boring and I had to put up with it for 40 hours while going through some of the most uninspired levels ever. I don't know if this applies on higher difficulties, but Lysithia absolutely destroyed anything that was removed remotely challenging, but Logo, why didn't you just play on a higher difficulty? Because I don't like playing games on hard mode. If there's a normal mode, then I'm going to be playing on normal mode for my first playthrough. Also, I'm not a graphics guy, but this game looks ugly as sin. I don't understand how this came out the same year as Pokemon Sword and Shield, yet everyone only had their negative attention set on that game. This game has environments that look like they've been in my toilet, embarrassing animations, and the wrath of the PNG oranges. Some might say, oh, well, Pokemon had way less content than Three Houses, and to be honest, you might have a point there, but don't make it out like this game didn't cut corners too. Numerous chapters are reused among all of the campaigns, so no, I don't think this game had as much effort put into it as people say. It was blatantly rushed as well. And what sucks so much about all of this is, I think I would have loved a game like this, especially a few years ago. I love RPGs, and especially recently, I appreciate it when games have such good replay ability that I immediately want to replay them almost as soon as I finish them. I see so many people having the time of their lives with this game, and as much as I think Three Houses is garbage, I really wish I could join in the fun. I can't though, and after what I played here, I think I'm just completely done with the series. <laughs> Our final entry today is one that I think I've made a very clear point in the past that I greatly dislike. I'm not the biggest fan of the previous rant because over time I've come to learn why a lot of fans of the game love it so much. But whenever I played it myself, after seeing all of the praise it received, I grew to hate it for a while because I see how so many people thought it was some modern masterpiece. I still don't think it deserves to be called a masterpiece, but in recent times I've thought about it more, and I can generally understand why it resonates with some people. As for me though, I've never, ever tried to like a game more than this one. But I just didn't.
Celeste might just cement itself as one of the most loved games ever made. It's an indie game that tells the story of a girl suffering from her own mental struggles while challenging herself to overcome a humongous mountain. It's about overcoming your problems no matter how challenging they may be, and considering what the gameplay is like, I never really realized how clever that is. The game is one of those modern difficult games, where it's focused on having you do one segment of the game multiple times until you're able to do it right and get past the challenge. It takes a lot of time, but no matter what, it's not hard enough to where you'll think you can't do it. There are a large variety of game mechanics and set pieces through each level, with each level gimmick getting expanded upon as you get further into the level. With everything I just mentioned, it's not a huge surprise that a lot of people love this game. But as for me, I don't click with this at all. This might just be the most not for me kind of game I've ever played. I completely understand why people like the story of the game for example, but as for me, I do get sad and even somewhat depressed at times of course, but I'm generally a very happy and optimistic person despite what it may seem. I love being happy and having a good time, so of course, I can't really say that I relate to the main character that much. Oh trust me, without getting into too much personal detail, during the middle of last year I was under so much stress and pressure that at times I simply could not bear it. However, this game didn't bring me any comfort because of its subject matter. I sought refuge in... Danganronpa music. <laughs> However, there's still the gameplay, which... I don't know dude, I like I have so many problems here it's not even funny. I've praised games like this before such as Cuphead and Katana Zero, but there's one key difference between all of these games. My issue with Celeste's difficulty comes with the fact that it feels like the game essentially wants to turn you into a TAS bot. Basically like a robot that can perfectly input certain commands at the right time. Maybe not that precise, but my point is that the game wants you to do every single level in one way and you keep doing it that way until you do it right. And I cannot stand that. I'm just doing the exact same thing over and over again until all of my inputs are correct. In Cuphead and Katana Zero, if I messed up on a level or boss, I would at times completely change the way I approach the challenge. Cuphead has different weapons and charms to fit your playstyle, as well as the bosses in general not having one set way you absolutely must beat them. Katana Zero will have open segments of levels giving you multiple different ways to mess around with stuff and fight every enemy. There's creativity and strategy there, there's not one set way for you to do it. And plus, once you do get past the challenge, you'll probably look and feel like a freaking badass, and the best part is that you came up with your own method of defeating every enemy. With Celeste though, by the time I get past the challenge, I don't feel that satisfied. All I can think is, oh finally I did it right. This isn't some knock at the game being too hard or whatever, I'm complaining about the game feeling repetitive. Recently I replayed some of the 3D Mario platformers, and instead of doing certain levels properly, I made up my own idiotic ways of doing them and skipping certain parts. And surprisingly, most of them worked and added brand new fun to these old games I had played as a kid. And trust me, I've tried. I really have tried liking this game. I've played it multiple times, done a good chunk of the extra content, and I am just not seeing it. I go into it so optimistic that I'll finally enjoy it this go around, and I come out feeling empty every single time. I can't relate with the characters, the story doesn't affect me that much, and the gameplay is not the kind of challenge that I like. I love games with high skill ceilings because I can replay them doing so much better than my first go around. This however, despite its appearance, does not have that same appeal to me as I've stated multiple times. And that's okay. I've come to terms with the fact that I will never like Celeste. It doesn't matter to me however because I already have plenty of games that I love. And I can live with not liking certain games as much as other people, especially considering my tastes. So anyway, please don't torch the comments, be respectful and all that good stuff. I'm a Lugo the Logician, and thank you very much for watching.